is my extreme pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Arnaud Bastilles. Uh, Dr. Bastilles is an anesthesiologist uh, practicing in Brussels, and he's the head of the virtual reality clinic uh, at Clinic St. Jean uh, Brussels. And he's gonna be speaking today about his use of virtual reality uh, in the operating room. Welcome Arnaud, thank you for being here all the way from Brussels. Ah, uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure, uh, uh, Robert. Uh, you have a, a lineup of fantastic speakers and it's really an honor to be, uh, to be part of that. So yes, my name is Arno Bostels. I'm an anesthetist from Brussels. Um, <clears throat> and um, I am uh, very happy to, uh, to um, talk with you or to discuss with you my use of practical use of, of VR. And I want to focus today on the use of VR as a digital uh, sedation tool. Now, you might be wondering why is an anesthetist wants to use digital uh, tool for sedation? Because we anesthetists, we, we are the experts of sedation, of course. We know all about the drugs we have to use. Now, um, I am not a, a geek and I'm not a gamer. Um, but I enjoy new technologies and more specifically new technologies that are better for the patient and better for the caregiver. And I have another example of such a technology and that is the use of ultrasound. When I finished my anesthesia training, there was no ultrasound in the operating theater. And soon after I finished my training, I was introduced to the use of ultrasound and I immediately realized that it would have a major impact on my uh, daily clinical practice. So I, I went to have an, an extra training of ultrasound. And, and today, when you have someone entering uh, uh, anesthesia training, you would not imagine that this person would not learn how to use the ultrasound. So maybe I have a good idea of, of what technology will be interesting in the field of anesthesia. And I had a very similar experience with, with virtual reality. When I, when I was introduced to VR, I immediately thought, oh, you know, we should use this to decrease the anxiety of our, our patients, preoperative anxiety. Every patient is nervous before surgery. Um, and, you know, sometimes we give pills to try to calm that anxiety, but it doesn't really work. We know we should go and talk to the patients, but, you know, we don't have time to do that. And I thought, well, maybe we can use VR to distract this patient and at least it would decrease their preoperative anxiety. Um, in my quest for more scientific information, I went to the Virtual Medicine Conference in 2018 in, in LA, which is a very interesting conference, by the way. And when I came back, I thought two things. First, I thought we need to make VR popular because VR works, um, but patients don't know about it and physicians don't know about it. And on the other hand, I thought, well, even if we have a lot of evidence that VR is working, in the field of anesthesia, we still need quite a lot of clinical trials to show that we can use it. So to make VR popular, I decided to create a VR unit in a hospital where I work. And I've also done some clinical trials. At this moment, we're running a trial um, 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 evaluating uh, the use of VR in, during uh, labor. Um, with VR units, I mean uh, a unit that is responsible um, to, for the implementation of the use of VR in the entire hospital. And um, one day I was working in the operating theater and I got a phone call and they said, hi, Arno, can you come and deliver VR to this patient? You gave it yesterday to her and, and now she wants it again. But I was running a surgical case, so I could not go up and give VR to that patient. That's the moment when I realized that um, if I wanted to be VR available in the entire hospital, VR had to be available in the different medical departments. And that's why I decided to create the VR unit. Now in the unit, we use VR to reduce pain, to reduce anxiety. Um, I use it as a sedation tool. Um, the idea is really to uh, offer VR to every patient of the hospital. And in the unit, I have included a reporting system. Um, the idea is that the user has to ask four questions. Uh, first question will be, um, or they, will, they have to say what kind of VR experience they used, for what kind of indication. Then they have to ask the patient if that patient would recommend VR to one of his friends. And then last, they have to answer the question whether or not they would use VR again for that patient in similar conditions. And 
last but not least, um, I'm using uh, VR hypnosis, which means that we're using VR experiences that are based on a hypnotic script. Uh, I believe it's very interesting because patients who are sensitive to hypnosis, and that is a vast majority of the patients, they can really experience a true self-hypnotic uh, uh, state. And patients who are not really sensitive to hypnosis, at least they have the advantage of the distraction that VR can offer them. So these are the departments that from the start, we're very interested in joining the VR unit. And these are the departments that are using VR uh, actively today. But I have to say that with the COVID-19 crisis, we suspended the use of VR for six months and um, trying now to motivate uh, people to, um, or motivate other departments to use VR is somewhat complicated. It, I feel that a lot of, pay, lot of people are tired um, they're afraid of the next wave coming and they're not really motivated to, for, uh, for innovation. Um, so the, re the, the, the restart of the unit has been somewhat complicated. But today we want to focus on sedation. And um, when I give sedation to my patients or during a procedure, I'm, f I'm using what people call procedural sedation or moderate sedation. There are four levels of sedation, mild, moderate, deep, and general anesthesia. And, and I'm going to talk about mild to moderate sedation. So when we go and look in the literature, and that's a slide from, from last year, so maybe it shifted a little bit, but on PubMed, when we were looking for VR and sedation, we found three studies talking about procedural sedation. And on clinical trials, there were six studies uh, uh, doing research about procedural sedation and VR. Now, these three studies, one is a retrospective, ret retrospective study, the other one is an RCT, and then there is a pilot and feasibility study. And um, the, the, the retrospective study says that VR may provide an effective non-pharmacological alternative. The RCT said that VR distraction is better than sedation with, uh, with, with drugs in terms of patients and anesthesiologist satisfaction and in avoiding respiratory side effects, which is, of course, very interesting. And then finally, the, the feasibility trial said, well, um, it is safe to provide, provide VR and it may confer a sedation sparing effect, which means that using VR for sedation is not such a crazy idea. Other people have been doing it before me. Now, one question remains for me, and that is, can we really call VR a sedation tool? Um, to answer that question, we should go back to the definition of sedation. And the definition of the European Society of Anesthesia says, PSA, which is procedural sedation analgesia, involves the use of hypnotic and analgesic medication. It enables effective performance of procedures whilst the patient is closely monitored for potential adverse effects. Now, this is, of course, about IV drug sedation. If we compare that with VR sedation, we have, of course, or we can at least eliminate the adverse effects. Um, I'm not saying we should eliminate the monitoring, but at least we don't have the same effects than with the IV drug sedation. Um, with the use of hypnotic VR, we have, of course, uh, an hypnotic and analgesic digital experience. And whenever I use VR in the operating theater, and I'm going to give you an example after that, um, generally surgeons are actually very impressed by the way the patient was really, really calm only with a digital tool. So when a surgeon says that he's impressed by the anesthesia, it actually means it was really, really good. So I think we can say that VR sedation enables effective performance of procedure uh, and of procedures, yes. So if we go and we look a little bit further and we go and we concentrate on the moderate of the procedural sedation, um, the ESA says, says that previously it was uh, termed conscious sedation, but that's of course a mistake because sedation always means there is a reduction of consciousness. And when we go and we look at the definition of the American Society of Anesthesiology, um, we can see that they, all, they also say that moderate sedation is a drug-induced depression of consciousness. So sedation means reduction of consciousness. Now, 
are we reducing consciousness with VR? Now, VR hypnosis. Now, to answer that question, we have to think about what is consciousness, which is, of course, a very difficult question. Um, and I don't think I will be able to, to uh, explain everything about it just in one slide, but I'm going to ask this guy to help me. And he's Professor Laurez. He's a professor from a, a, a university in Belgium, but he's the coordinator of the coma group and they're doing research on consciousness in coma patients and they have of course an extremely wide knowledge about consciousness now he works in the same university university hospital than this lady and she's professor femonville she's a professor of anesthesia and she's also a woman who introduced the use of, of hypnosis in the world of anesthesia now professor laurence says that the consciousness can be divided in two parts, in the arousal or awakeness and the awareness. And when the level of awakeness and, and awareness is, is high, then we are, of course, in a, a, a conscious awake state. If the level of um, wakefulness and awareness is extremely, extremely low, we are either in general anesthesia or in coma. And then there are all sorts of in the intermediate positions. Now, what Professor Laurence says that is awareness can be divided into internal and external awareness. Internal awareness being, of course, being aware of what's happening inside my body and external awareness being aware of what's happening around my body. Now, together with Professor Femoville, they found out that with hypnosis, they were actually decreasing the external awareness. And of course, when we go up the, the slide, we can say that we decrease awareness and we could hypothesize that we are decreasing consciousness with hypnosis or with VR hypnosis. That is, of course, not a definite answer to the question, are we reducing uh, consciousness with hypnosis? I think this is just the start of a great debate we should have about VR and um, sedation. Um, I want to give you a practical example. This is a patient who is going to have a pacemaker and um, the surgeon is putting some local anesthesia underneath the skin and the anesthetist is giving generally IV sedation. In this case, this is just a VR sedation. Now I'm going to show you some data. This is retrospective data. I'm assisting this is not prospective data. Um, these, are, uh, the, this is, these are the drugs that were given to 16 patients just randomly, I just chose them randomly. Um, and they pat these patients only get, got IV sedation, no VR. And these are 16 patients that I started with VR and then after that I gave some more uh, drugs if it was needed to achieve a uh, nice sedation. And when we put those two tables next to each other, I think it is pretty safe to say that when we start with virtual reality, um, the VR decreases the need for IV sedation to achieve a nice moderate uh, sedation for uh, uh, the implantation of a pacemaker. Now, of course, all these 16 patients were included in the unit and we have the reporting system. And when uh, uh, the user, which is me, would ask the patient if they would recommend the use of VR to a, patient, to a friend, five of them say they would not recommend uh, VR to a friend or only five. And the reason is that um, one of them experienced a, a technical problem, was overheating of the phone and the VR experience actually just stopped in the middle of it. Uh, another patient had trouble with the positioning of the EHMD and there were actually three, only three patients saying that they did not really appreciate the VR experience. Now, this was retrospective data. If we would like to have prospective data, we, should, we, we would have to, of course, monitor the amount of drugs we're giving, but it will also be very interesting to talk about the side effects. And here I mean, of course, the use of oxygen or the oxygen saturation, hemodynamic stability, and then movements. Um, my personal experience is that um, when patients are sedated only with VR, they make a lot less movements than if they are sedated with IV drugs because when they have a sedation with IV drugs, at a certain point, you have the risk to lose control over the patient and then they can start to move in an uncontrolled way, which is of course very uh, uh, difficult for the surgeon. Um, but 
if we would have a prospective trial, we would also have to think about the patient experience and the surgeon experience. Now, what I can say about patient experience is that since I've been using VR um, as the sedation tool for the implantation of pacemakers, I've had two patients sending a letter to the hospital administration saying how happy they were with the care they received. And I never had such a, a, a letter from patients when I used IV drugs. And uh, I said before that surgeon experience, in my experience, they're generally very happy when I use that because they they think it's a great sedation and they realize how happy the patient is after that because patients don't have to wait before they can eat, etc., etc., etc. One last question I want to address is how can we evaluate if the sedation is successful with VR or not? I don't think we should use the um, conventional sedation uh, skills because they have been designed to be used with, uh, or they have been designed to be used when we are given sedation with conventional IV drugs. So, to start to address that question, in the um, um, study we're running now in the labor work, one of the secondary outcomes is the use of the uh, CPO2, and CPO2 is a criteria critical care pain of an observation tool. And um, with the tool, they are um, 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 making four observations, vocalization, facial expression, body movement, and muscle tension. And um, when I give VR to a patient for sedation, these are exactly the same, the same uh, um, observations that I make to, to try to guess whether or not the patient is indeed uh, uh, having a good sedation or not. So of course, I hope that in that study, I will have a positive correlation between a higher COPT score and then a higher pain score in the patients and, uh, and a lower comfort score in the patient, which would mean that the CPO2 might be a good tool to um, um, evaluate sedation with virtual reality. I would like to end with this picture. This is a picture of a woman who's really minutes uh, before having a pacemaker implanted. And you can see that she's almost smiling thanks to the VR she gets. And that is, of course, why we're giving VR to our patients. So thank you for your attention.